Um, I just want to say hi to everyone. We're so excited to be able to host this conference. Um, obviously, it was a little bit of a bummer that uh, COVID affected the chief resident conference that generally takes place in Kansas City. And I know that most of you were slated to attend that. Um, but we want to be able to celebrate you and to be able to provide some tools for you as you go through this year because it's really important for you to be able to feel confident as leaders and as chiefs. Um, I just want to take a second and introduce myself. My name is Jen Bunch. I uh, grew up in Indiana, went to IU School of Medicine, uh, and then did my residency here at Ball. Um, I've been in medical education in some form or fashion for the last um, 18, 19 years. Um, and um, have really uh, enjoyed working with residents uh, throughout the time that I've been in med ed. I was also a chief resident, and uh, interestingly enough, as I talked to some of the chiefs from last year, some of the exercises that they did at the chief resident conference were ones that I did many years ago as well. So um, some things are still applicable, and um, one thing that's uh, for sure is that you are leaders and that you have been elected uh, and chosen by your peers and by your faculty um, to represent you, all of the residents and also be a liaison um, between the residents and the faculty. And so we just thank you so much for your willingness to take on this role uh, and we want to be able to support you. So we hope that this is actually for the first of many uh, meetings that we'll be able to have with you and we want to be able to provide that support for you. So if you have questions even moving out of this meeting or things that you want to discuss or topics you'd like to address, we'd really love to hear that. So um, today, well, we're really excited that you're all here. And most of you have introduced yourselves your, uh, through the, the chat. So we're really, um, we encourage you to take a look through that. But to keep us on time, I'm going to ask um, the outgoing chiefs to do a brief introduction of, the, of themselves. Um, and that way we can kind of get to know them because there will be sources of wisdom for us as we go through this uh, session tonight. Um, I'm assuming all of you have received the agenda, so you kind of know what we're going to be talking about. Um, and so you can feel free to follow that. Uh, and so for right now, though, I'd really like to introduce Abby from Ball, uh, Kevin from St. Francis or St. Franciscan Health, and then also Jordan. Um, and Jordan, you're from St. Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's start with Abby. Why don't you just give us a brief introduction of yourself um, and then we'll go to Kevin next and then finish with Jordan. And then after that, we'll be um, moving into our keynotes address. All right, hi everybody. My name is Abby Chilson. I am a current third year outgoing chief at Ball Memorial in Muncie. Um, I actually grew up in the great state of Wisconsin. I love my cheese and my long vowels and brought those to Indiana uh, for the past three years. Um, and next, I'm actually pursuing fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine in Durham, North Carolina at Duke. So I'll be moving down there in, in a couple of weeks. Great. Thanks, Abby. Kevin? Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So Kevin McNulty, I'm from Franciscan Health here in Indianapolis. I grew up down in French Lake, Indiana, and I'm going into a fellowship as well in geriatric medicine at St. Vincent's in Indianapolis. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Jordan, thank you for uh, joining us. I'm... Uh, I'm Jordan Jurofsky. I am the one of the two outgoing chiefs uh, originally from Ohio, came to Indiana for training, and myself and actually my co-chief are both staying for the sports medicine fellowship here in town and then for sports medicine practice afterwards. Fantastic. Three chiefs, three fellowships. It's awesome. All right. Well, I think we're going to be in, a, um, in for a real treat uh, this afternoon as we listen to um, our keynote address. Um, 
dealing with the topic of influence because any leader really needs to understand the power of influence. And so Dr. Witt has um, created a video and I think, like I said, we're going to be in for a real treat. So why don't we uh, turn our attention and focus to him right now. Hello everyone, my name is Justin Witt and I'm a family physician and a program director. I remember when I was at the point in my training where you are now. Today, I would like to talk to you about the importance of developing influence as a leader. First, I need to make sure that we have the same understanding of the word influence. Influence is different from power or authority. Authority can be given, but influence must be earned. Power can be abused by ambitious people for selfish gain, but influence requires choice on the part of another. Influence is the ability to affect another person or group of people without force, coercion, or intimidation. Influence can be directed at the wrong thing or from improper motives, but the type of influence that I'm referring to is used to build connections, cohesion, and community. Great leaders do just that. They build connections with others, they create cohesion, and they invest in community. Vince Lombardi is one of the most famous coaches of all time. He said, leaders are made, they are not born. They are made by hard effort, which is the price which all of us must pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. I don't know where you come from, but I'm sure that you have an interesting story. Here is my story. I grew up in a town of less than a thousand people. I lived with two parents who worked hard to make ends meet and near my grandparents who farmed. Out of 13 cousins, I was one of three who pursued a university degree. My personal physician, a family doctor who delivered me with forceps, spurred me to apply to medical school. I'm a completely ordinary person. And over the many years since medical school, I've often found myself in positions of leadership Sometimes those positions are elected, and often they result in me having some artificial position of authority over other people who are or were my peers. My leadership abilities have grown over time, mostly as a result of three things, reading, real world practice, and emulating other great leaders. Each of these three is intertwined with the others. It has been said that leaders are readers, and I find that I've learned so much by reading and reflecting on real world events and how I responded to them. In many cases, my failures in the real world of leadership drive me to reflect on what I could have handled better. Learning from our mistakes is key. We can also learn by watching others lead, learn from their mistakes. We can see examples of great leadership as well as poor. The cyclical process helps me to continually shape my leadership. Mostly, I haven't had epic failures, but rather there were lackluster moments of missed opportunity. I tend to sell myself short, downplaying the influence that I have. In those times, I might rather advocate, or perhaps we'll call it what it is, complain to those with more authority. Surely they can just make things right. Once or twice, I might have fired off an email to these so-called authorities full of assertive language and profound arguments for truth all the while avoiding the actual source of the issue. Then someone might ask a great leadership question. Have you talked to that person? Have I talked to that person? That person? I, I don't want to talk to that person. I don't have any authority over that person. They're not even in my department. But you know what? It doesn't matter what authority I have. What really matters is how I influence that person. I have found two factors two essential factors that affect how much influence I have as a leader. Those two factors are who I relate to and how much those people trust me. Often leaders find themselves in a position where there's no way to please everyone. Perhaps you've already found yourself in between this proverbial rock and a hard place. This is where that trust is put to the test. By listening carefully, asking the right questions and relating to people, Leaders can build cohesion. This is not easy work, but there are skills to practice and improve upon, and the rewards are great. A workplace, much like a family, is a collection of people, 
But unlike a family, the people in a workplace often have much more diverse backgrounds and beliefs. This does make for challenges in building cohesion. However, this diversity of thought patterns and life experiences is also a tremendous asset to the organization when it is appreciated and respected. By embracing this challenge, we can learn much from each other. I'm an introvert by nature, which means I tend to draw energy from my solitude and spend energy in relating to other people. Relating to others is not completely comfortable to me. My whole job deals with people, and people can be messy. In fact, every person I've ever worked with has done or said something at some point that doesn't jive with me. Sometimes I just don't want to talk to other people. What helps me most in building relationships are maintaining grace, humility, and curiosity. Curiosity about others' stories, about their beliefs and their journey. Grace because, well, people are messy. And humility to stay grounded that together we are stronger and to remember how many times I failed and had to get back up. In fact, it is because of the community of the workplace that I've been able to get back up. This is the importance of that community and the great paradox of what I'm teaching. Building connections, creating cohesion, investing in community, these take a lot of hard work. And in doing these things, I derive the motivation to propel myself forward, even during the hardest times. I can trust that community to support me when I need it the most. One of my hardest days as a leader came about three years into my role of program director. I probably don't have to sell you very hard that recruitment is very important to program directors. After scores of interviews in three months, we completed a masterpiece at a rank list. Then we had a month of waiting. Match week finally came, and I anxiously awaited our Monday morning email letting us know that our program filled. I experienced this twice before as a program director, and I knew the sweet feeling brought by that message. It was like total vindication for the countless hours spent reading applications, meeting new faces, some of whom I might never see again. I was ready for that feeling. Finally, the email came. Now, I'm really never excited for email, but I was genuinely excited for that message. And then, wait, what is this? I just keep rereading the words. Positions offered, 10. Positions filled, 6. I was floored. What went wrong? I started to wonder who was to blame. Did we change something? Thoughts kept swirling as I just sat and stared at my computer. I felt a sick feeling in my stomach as I thought about what I might say to my fellow directors and to my residents. It took me about 30 minutes to get over the shock of that moment. But what I did next made all the difference in the outcome of that week. I started writing. I wrote out a strategy. I created a map for what the next step needed to be and the step after that. I thought about how to express the complex emotions that I felt. My strategy centered around the fact that great athletes sometimes lose, dancers stumble and sometimes fall, and great culinary creations don't always turn out. I said to my team, we worked hard together, and I'm proud of all of you. I am so sorry to tell you that we did not fill. Teddy Roosevelt once said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. I was that man in the arena. The response from my team was shock, and I knew exactly what they were feeling. But then a wonderful turn happened as I told them what we needed to do. This is the path forward. Follow me. We are not defeated. We have much work to do, and we will pull this off. We're going to do great things this week. And yes, in fact, that is what we did. This event turned into one of the most memorable highlights of the entire year, and not just for me. Going through this struggle brought our team closer together than any more successful recruiting year ever has. As a leader, you can use your influence to build connections, create a richer community, and advance the causes that you care about. As a new leader, you may feel as though you have authority but little to no influence. 
Influence doesn't come with the title. You sow the seeds, water, and tend to it. There are some specific steps to take to grow your influence. Some of these we have discussed today. Number one, build connections every chance you get. Be curious about others' beliefs and goals. Listen and seek to understand. Two, work toward cohesion. This takes effort as you first seek to understand and then communicate from your heart. Three, invest in community. Show concern and advocate for the shared mission. Four, build trust. Pursue your work with excellence and be consistent in meeting or exceeding expectations. Develop expertise that others will respect. And five, strategize and be solution focused. Practice setting achievable goals and follow through. As a chief resident, part of your strategy will be to how to liaison between the leaders of your program and the other residents. I invite you to discuss that with our panel of outgoing chiefs. These skills and others do take practice, but over time they will become more natural. Sometimes you will fail, but failure is temporary, and in a supportive community, you will never fail alone. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of our conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Witt. Uh, he put a lot of time and effort into uh, creating that um, keynote address, and I think that it was really powerful, um, and I just want to say thank you to him um, for doing that. I think sometimes uh, understanding the important role that you have as chiefs can be, can be tough, um, but I think going back to those foundational ideas of building relationships and um, building trust with the people that you lead uh, is so important. And so right now, I want you to think about a couple of things. We're going to have an exercise and we're going to break out into breakout rooms. And Abby and Kevin and Jordan are going to lead you uh, as we go through this. Um, so think about the best leader that you know. Um, most of us aren't going to have to scroll through our contacts to think, oh, I wonder who comes to my mind, um, because that person is going to immediately come to mind um, because that person has had influence on you. Um, leaders are generally rare, and so you are amongst uh, a rare and important group of people. Um, but think about the characteristics of this person. How does that person make you feel? Um, does that person bring positivity to your life? Does that person bring a sense of calm uh, to the relationship that you have with him or her? Um, how does that person give their time? Um, how, how have you noticed that person interact with other people? Um, how, does that person make you feel better about yourself? Um, what kinds of things define uh, that leader that comes to your mind? So um, you're going to be uh, looking at that question when you think of one person you admire as a leader. Um, what characteristics jump out at you? And then how can you start building those characteristics into your leadership? I believe there's going to be a slide that comes up that will list those two uh, questions maybe. Um, and if it does come up, then I would like for, um, there we go, I would like for the, the chiefs who are leading these breakout sessions to snap a quick picture of that so that you have a good memory of what the questions are that we're going to be addressing. Um, and again, what characteristics jump out at you? about that person that you admire as a leader, and then how can you build some of those characteristics into your leadership? So answer those two questions in your breakout groups, and then come back and we'll spend some time sharing some insights that we received during that. Uh, the session that I was a part of was fantastic. There was some really good discussion. So I think, uh, 
we'd like to spend a few minutes now sort of unpacking some of the things that you were able to discuss during that session. So um, were there any themes that came out of your particular breakout group uh, regarding characteristics that are um, admired uh, in leaders that are meaningful to each of you? So maybe answer that question. Were there any themes that kind of came out? And session leaders, you can feel free to chime in as well, but uh, I would also love to hear from the incoming chiefs. Well, I think one of the main things that jumped out from ours is uh, at least two of us had mentioned just the value of being present um, and being available for any type of feedback or concerns that might come up. So presence um, was one of the themes. Right, the value of being present in the moment and really um, conveying that you're listening and that you care about what's being said. Um, I think something that a couple of us mentioned um, with mentors um, or, or leaders in our lives had been that um, they challenge us um, because they care about us. Um, and I thought that was a theme that stood out. Lauren, I will say it's a little bit hard to hear you. Okay. Sorry. Um, can you hear me any better? Yes, much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say a theme, uh, a couple things um, that some of us said uh, were related to leaders or mentors in our lives um, being willing to challenge us um, and ask um, questions that uh, made us reflect um, or um, made us see areas in which we could have improved in our lives. <clears throat> so being present, but also conveying thoughts or ideas or questions that could challenge you to grow uh, in the field of medicine and also as a leader. Anything else? Other themes or thoughts? Don't be shy. Group two brought up uh, was a lot about learning to delegate and not feeling like you have to fall on the sword just because you're supposed to be leading your peers. That's great. I love that. Don't fall on swords, people. What else? Was it easy for you to think of that leader? To think of that person that has influenced you that perhaps you want to take some characteristics from and model? Did you have some faces or names come to mind pretty easily? A few little head shakes. Anyone want to comment on that? I mean, I, it wasn't too hard for me to think of uh, good leaders. Um, I've been exposed to a lot of different people through like church and through work and all sorts of, and obviously through medicine as well. So um, it, having been around a lot of people, uh, there certainly were a few faces that kind of came to mind pretty, pretty quickly for me. Um, Fortunately, it wasn't the bad ones that came to mind first, so which is sometimes that tends to happen with me, but um, so it wasn't, wasn't too bad. I don't, I don't know. Thank you so much, James. Uh, also, your I'm having just a little bit hard time hearing you too, so um, next time. Okay. Yeah, just bring that a little closer because you have some. I, I really blame my my mom has a soft voice, and so I, I kind of uh, inherited that a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> I'll speak a little bit louder next time too. No, thank you. I I heard you, but yeah, for next time that'd be great. Thank you. Those were really good insights. 
Okay, well, at this time, we are going to go back to breakout rooms to kind of look at another question. So you are going to see another screen. So facilitators, if you can snap a picture, that would be fantastic. So we're going to move a little bit in the same direction, but kind of a different vein. So we're gonna have about 15 minutes to talk about this and really evaluate balancing our personality because all of us bring different personalities to the table. We know that. And one of the things that's uh, important and sometimes difficult to navigate as a chief resident or any leader in any position is, is that mix of personalities that people bring to the table, right? So how do you balance your own personality and your own style of communication? Um, like James was just saying, I get this from my mom. I'm a bit uh, soft-spoken. That's okay. Um, some other people might have a more boisterous way of communicating. But but whichever way that you communicate, that's you and that's uniquely you and that's important to be able to embrace and own. So how do we balance that personality and our communication styles um, to sort of garner the influence that we are able to, um, to give um, to this role? So number one, how can I, as an introvert or an extrovert, or someone that talks a lot, or someone that doesn't talk much at all, um, or you know, fill in the blank. There are a variety of different characteristics that can describe us, but how can I, as that person, relate more or better um, to others? Um, sorry. Uh, and then also, the next one is how can I build trust? Remember what Dr. Witt was saying in his, uh, in his address or his little talk, um, you know, the two really key components to being an effective leader are building relationships and building trust. So um, how can we do that? How can we build that trust uh, as a leader? So take about 15 minutes, join your breakout room, and then come back and we'll share when you're done. Uh, my session that I uh, was able to hear again was really powerful. Um, there's so much wisdom uh, on this Zoom screen right now. Um, so, so much talent and so many um, fantastic leadership skills. I'm really excited about this year uh, for all of our residencies. And um, I think uh, one of the things I know that the planning committee has had in their vision is uniting the Indiana residencies and making us stronger as one. Um, and uh, making us each better because of the other. And so I think it was really insightful to hear some of what our residents are sharing and um, some of the insights that they have and some of the dreams that they have for their year as chief. So uh, as we kind of come back together, I would love to hear uh, kind of what you guys talked about, what Themes may, again, may have arisen, something that one of the other people said that was meaningful to you. Um, so let's spend a little time kind of sharing um, some of those thoughts and insights. So uh, I'll, I guess I'll kick it off here. Interestingly, our, our group was uh, composed of four introverts. Um, and so uh, one of the main things that we all felt was one of our biggest strengths is that we kind of all uh, tend to listen and internalize things, um, uh, allowing us time to kind of process before kind of jumping in, um, which uh, can be very helpful in leadership circumstances when you're trying to, you know, come up with a solution to a problem or when you're listening to one of your, one of the underclassmen just kind of uh, getting to know them a little bit better and kind of when they're, you know, a little down, getting just noticing those little uh, subtle things that are showing you that they're struggling. And we, we kind of all felt that all of that, being able to internalize and watch and observe and everything was, was a strength that would help build trust among everyone in our program. That's a really great point. Thank you for bringing that up. 
other thoughts coming out? Utilizing your own personality, communication style. How are you building trust? I thought something that jumped out during ours that Dom had said um, was there's nothing worse in residency than trying to have a problem, having a problem and having that problem fall on to deaf ears. Um, and it just basically not getting anything worked up as soon as it happens. So I think the biggest thing is, is, um, when that does happen to us, investigating that. And I think investigating and, um, not just taking a problem for its face value, uh, will help kind of develop that trust, trust. Mm -hmm. Great point. Any other thoughts? We have one spokesperson from each group. How about an, how about that third group? Or were there just two groups? Okay. Rachel can talk. <laughs> Rachel, you're being called out, Rachel. Um, so what, uh, there was a kind of a theme in our conversation about like advocacy and really just being a voice for uh, your co-residents, um, whether you are introverted or extroverted, if people are bringing problems, you know, forward, um, it's your duty and responsibility to kind of to chase that down and um, kind of what Aaron was uh, saying, just investigate a little bit more and see where those people are coming from um, and just advocate for them. Absolutely. I think advocacy is such an inherent and important skill in being family doctors. Um, and so sometimes um, we don't always think about translating that over into our leadership, um, but sometimes it comes very naturally. And I think that you're bringing up a really good point about the importance of advocacy in our leadership role, particularly that leadership role of being chief resident. Okay, great stuff guys, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna move into a time now. I wanna ask the outgoing chiefs a few questions um, because I think that this is a great opportunity for us to be able to learn from them because they'll be leaving us soon and any future meetings that we have will likely not uh, be able to include them because um, they'll be off doing fellowship and, and learning more and impacting our specialty in a really positive way. So. Uh, before they leave, I think it's really uh, important to get some insights from them. So the first question I want to ask you three is, what helped you get to where you are? Um, and you can look at that as the bigger picture, like to where you are in life and medicine and that sort of thing. But I guess I'm specifically also interested in what helped you to get where you are as a, as a chief resident um, so that some of those insights might be helpful to our incoming chief residents. Um, I, I guess I will start. First and foremost, my co-chief and I have very similar personalities. Uh, um, we work well together. We're going to be co-fellows and then partners after fellowship. So we obviously get along very well and had a very open line of communication. Um, the other thing that you guys aren't really getting since there's no like formal chief conference is at the first chief conference we had in Kansas City, they really encouraged us to pick a chief mentor. Um, it, it could have been a faculty member, it could have been something com someone completely unrelated to the residency. Um, I would really encourage you guys to do that. It was a good help to have someone, one to vent to if I ever felt frustrated with the role as chief, which you will find happens fairly often. Um, and two, it was good to have someone as like an outside voice to bounce things off of. If there was an issue, 
and they, my co-chief and I thought of a way that we wanted to address it, just being like, hey, this is how we plan to present this at faculty meeting. How are you receiving this? How do you think faculty will receive that? That way you're kind of have an idea of what you're going to say and how it might be received before you say it. So right. Get along with your co-chief, find a mentor. Great points, Jordan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would echo with Jordan. Um, I was able, I reached out to my the former chief before me a lot to vent and get sort of feedback on the same sort of issues. I would also, one message I would like to get out there is um, to meet with your faculty one-on-one -on -one before the faculty meetings. Um, like trying to kind of get their impressions on what your planning is or the issues ahead of time um, before the meeting. Uh, we kind of talked in our group about how um, you kind of get a rubber stamp of approval for big um, plans or decisions that are being made in meetings, but they don't really happen in those meetings. Um, so meeting with people one-on-one -on -one, outside of those meetings is really when you get the most work done. I think one of the greatest challenges that I faced um, as chief was kind of figuring out where my identity was. Um, I felt like when I became a chief, I almost ceased to be a regular resident, but at the same time, you're definitely still a resident and not a faculty member. So it can be isolating at times to be in that role. And one thing that was really vital for me was finding safe places where I felt confident in myself and could practice my own wellness. So for me, that was riding my bike and getting out in nature and spending time with the people that I love. Um, and so while we're all thinking about um, becoming chiefs and all the ways that we can impact our programs and all the ways that we can reach out and help other people, I hope that all of you also remember that a big piece of this is just like as physicians, we can't take good care of other people unless we also take time out to care for ourselves. The same is true when you're a chief. So, um, you know, reach out to your faculty members, ask for help when you need it. Um, you know, some of my faculty members have become the greatest supports that I've had thus far in residency. And I've been able to talk very openly with them about this kind of limbo state that I felt like I was in. Um, and I know that other past chiefs have also felt that way. Um, so don't, don't get discouraged if you feel that way, but definitely find those places where you can just be you and build yourself up. Great points, Abby. And I think that echoes a lot of um, emphasis that we've heard today, um, at least in the breakout sessions about the importance of wellness. Okay, the next question I have for you is, um, what has slowed you down? What has sort of put you on a detour over this last year that you've really learned something from um, and will be able to build on or that the incoming chiefs might be able to gain some insight from? Jordan is giggling. <laughs> there must be a good We're, story. We all just keep thinking, who's going to say it? It's going to be coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I guess, uh, so the other two chiefs, or outgoing chiefs might have noticed this too, but I did away rotations in order to look at potential fellowships. I actually went to Duke, loved it. I hope you have a great time. Um, but my co-fellow also did away rotations. Granted, we, for the most part, did them at different times, but one of the things that was a struggle earlier in the year that I think we both kind of grew on is for seeing potential issues and trying to make a plan for them and communicating that really openly with faculty. 
Um, so we were both, he was on vacation. I was actually in Colorado. So the time difference changed as well. And we had a resident who had a medical emergency. And we both thought there was a plan like, oh, if anything happens, talk with this person. Um, but we hadn't really communicated that. So then, of course, the time that we're both gone, an issue happens and faculty was not aware of our, like what we thought was an okay plan. We thought our plan was very obvious and then it, it caused some issues and just communication lines. And then once we were both back in, like in person, I encourage you really to draw attention to issues like that. So we had a faculty meeting. Well, we met with Marty, our program director first. We're like, hey, this is what we thought was the problem. This is what faculty saw was the problem. And then we kind of addressed it head on with all of the faculty. Um, and I think from then on, communication was a lot more open and got rid of a lot of tension. Um, so try to foresee potential issues, especially if you're gonna be away or, you know, Christmas is coming up and who's gonna be covering things like that. Um, and if there are any issues or drawbacks during the year, really address them head on and early. Jen, can I jump in? Absolutely. You know, I've been quiet in a large group, but Jordan sharing that story. In a way, I hope all of you incoming chiefs have that unsuspected near catastrophe challenge that somewhat blindsides you. You're in this, this 12 month of growth and learning. And what Justin's example he gave in the opening talk in terms of that third year and that sinking feeling, um, it's wow, you're gonna have the opportunity. It was a turning point in Jordan and her co-chiefs David's year as chief when how they addressed it, when they came to myself, they wanted they were the ones who wanted to talk to faculty and get this on the table. Um, it was huge, and I hope you guys can all experience that and uh, also build some, well, the lifelong relationships, I hope, to where we, we want them here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, that's, that's very powerful, and I think definitely will impact the group that's here. Um, learning from those sinking feeling moments and from those things that are near disasters um, is part of life's journey, of course, but um, when it happens in your profession and in the course of residency, um, it, it's, it's professionally um, formative um, and and for yourself, but also for others. And I think that's why this particular uh, forum is so meaningful because we're learning from each other, um, those things that are our victories and those things that were stumbling blocks, um, um, all of it's formative. So anyone else have stories of like detours or um, kind of missteps that happened through the year? Of course, of course COVID. Um, <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out, Jordan, uh, <laughs> is probably the most impactful thing that's happened to all of us in every aspect of our lives um, this year. But um, any other story, and maybe the story that you have um, surrounds COVID. Any other stories, Abby or Kevin? I don't have a specific story, but I would just, one thing that I always found is what, that you get that sort of imposter syndrome of being in a leadership role and thinking that you're the one that needs to come up with solutions to the problems that you see. And everyone in my program smarter than I am, thank God. And so just saying, this is the problem, this is what we need to address. And how many times my colleagues came up with brilliant solutions that I had never even considered. Um, um, there's so many smart people in all of our programs and so utilizing that brain trust to figure out the best way forward is so essential to address every single problem that's going to come up so really rely on your people 
I think another big thing is to trust yourself. You are like placed in this position for a reason. Your colleagues chose you because they trust you. They chose you because they feel that you are a good fit um, to lead the residency. And you can't always make everybody happy. In fact, I'd go out on a limb and say most times you're not going to make everybody happy. And you just have to trust that what that your heart is in the right place, that you're thinking through things the right way, and that ultimately um, you're doing the right thing for for the greater good. Um, and if if people aren't happy with the decisions that you're making, um, you just have to be comfortable reaching out to people and saying, "I know that wasn't what you were hoping for, and I'm really sorry." Uh, I'm, I'm on your team. I'm on your side here. How, how can I help make this still a good experience? Great. Excellent point, both of you. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Jordan and Abby and Kevin, for the leadership that you have provided to your individual residencies for the last year. And by doing so, the way that you've been able to provide leadership for our state and for our specialty, we wish you well next year. We know that you're going to represent Indiana in amazing ways at your fellowship sites, um, and you will have an incredible career ahead of you. So thank you so much for participating today and for the role that you've played this last year. We really are so grateful to each one of you. So thank you. Um, I also wanna thank the planning committee uh, for this. Um, Dr. Witt has put a lot of effort and work into this and um, gave just such a beautiful um, uh, opening address and Dr. Wishhouse has um, been part of that as well. And so we thank you so much, Marty, for your involvement. And then also Dr. Anderson at Franciscan. Um, those three were the ones that were the masterminds of this and were able to sort of bring us together as a state. Um, and so I just, I, I'm I'm honored to be able to be a part of it because I think it's fantastic for us to be able to have an opportunity to work collaboratively um, with our chiefs throughout the state so that we can better um, the healthcare systems here for our Hoosiers um, and continue to um, grow and develop leaders in our specialty. So uh, I just wanna thank each one of you for being involved in particular thanks to that planning committee. Um, kind of today as we close, I was noticing that there were some themes, um, not just in each one of those questions, but really throughout the entire uh, time that we've had together. And I think, um, as you mentioned, Jordan, I think advocacy is really important. And, um, and as I said, you know, we're advocates just as family doctors. And so sometimes I feel like advocacy comes naturally to us uh, as, as humans who are drawn to family medicine. Um, and so I would say, let's use that advocacy um, through this year as chiefs, um, because I think that you have so much potential in so many ways that you can advocate for your fellow residents and for your patients and for our specialty and discipline of family medicine. Um, the other thing that people mentioned a lot was how much they appreciated transparency. And several people mentioned that they appreciated uh, Dr. Witt's transparency when he was talking about how difficult it was uh, on his third year of being a program director of not filling. We all have those moments when we feel like our stomach falls out from underneath us. Um, and so being able to be vulnerable and transparent and sharing those um, and not just transparency in our, um, like, things that happen that way, but it, transparency in new policies and transparency in, and um, Aaron was bringing up some examples of transparency in, like, how you do call, and, and so was Dom. And so I think um, just that general theme of being transparent as a leader is really important. The other thing that 
came about um, was the ability to listen. And something I tell myself all the time is that we have two ears and one mouth. Uh, and so we really should listen twice as much as we speak. Spend time listening to your colleagues, listening to your patients, listening to your faculty, listening to your office staff and your administrative staff, um, because they have wisdom. I like what um, you were saying about brain trust, Kevin. I think that's so valuable. You don't have to fix everything. Um, you uh, have such a wealth of knowledge surrounding you um, in all aspects of your life, really, but particularly in your role as chief resident. And so listening well is such an important thing. And then the, the last thing that uh, I will say um, that kind of came through as a theme um, today was the empowerment, um, how we use our leadership to empower others. I was at a conference uh, it's been a couple of years ago now, and the speaker came up to me. Um, I don't, I didn't know him, um, and I didn't have any kind of relationship with him, but he came up to me uh, during one of the breaks, and he said, hey, I want you, I want to ask you a question, and I said, what's that? Uh, and he said, um, when you came to this conference, did you expect that I would impact your life? And um, I said, absolutely, you know, that's why you go to conferences, right? To listen to people that are going to impact your life. Uh, and he said, so do you think I've impacted your life? And I said, yeah. And um, he said, well, do you think that you've impacted my life? And I said, well, to be honest with you, no, I'm just in the audience. And he said, I just want you to know that you've impacted my life and I will always remember you. And he said, I... I live my life expecting that my life will impact every person that I meet. And that was just a really powerful moment to me um, because if you live your life with that kind of intention, then it will have an impact. Um, and so I just want you guys to be aware of the fact that your life will have an impact and to live your lives with that intention that your life will make a difference in the lives of people that you encounter. And so I just am so excited about your leadership and the way that um, this year will unfold. Um, if you have an opportunity to go ahead and put in the chat um, comments, uh, any ideas that you have for future sessions, we really want to hear your input um, and uh, your thoughts. Um, we will likely be sending you an evaluation as well so that we can kind of assess what your thoughts were for this and so that we can better uh, uh, plan for future sessions and also address what needs you have uh, as chief. So. I'm just really excited about your leadership. Like I said, uh, any other comments, um, particularly from like Dr. Witt or Dr. Wishhouse, because um, the three of us are gonna peace out here so that you guys can talk. Yes. Woo. Wonderful. Echo, echo, echo. Okay, cool. um, uh, someone may have mentioned this earlier, but you guys, one of the most tremendous things about being in family medicine education has been the networking. Um, and at the national level, um, I can't tell you how many times over the 20 plus years I hear of Indiana. Um, and one of those facts may, that may have been lost, the Association of Family Medicine Residency Directors, that originated from those who went before you, the uh, faculty leadership from the state of Indiana. Um, Cliff Knight, who's previously from Community Health, who's out there in AAFP, you just, yes, Indiana, you guys, I want you to realize this, the state you're in and the family medicine physicians that you're around your respective programs is tremendous. Um, so we did hope one of the goals out of this would be the networking. It's one of the reasons we're getting off of here. Um, and even if there's a lack of ideas of what to talk about in future gatherings, if we just can provide the platform to get together and you guys share with or without us. And um, Jen, thanks so much for emceeing this and, and uh, getting us all to talk. Um, but we wanted to provide a platform where you guys can talk and share. Because I I, I'm hearing some rumors about what might be available nationally. Um, I contacted the AAFP office as 
uh, Justin and Carrie and I worked on this, but nothing was coming out soon enough. I wanted to give you guys some, at least a few building blocks to get started. Thanks for uh, giving us your gift of time tonight. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.